Now tonight, I said, uh, of course, we have a, a lecture series that's part of this event called the Princeton Lectures on Youth, Church, and Culture. This lecture series uh, was kicked off in 1996, again, under this assumption that theology and youth ministry belong to each other. So sometimes we bring in practical theologians who are really well-versed in the practice of youth ministry, and sometimes we bring in people who aren't connected to practical theology formally in, in um, the academy, so to speak. Uh, the, these lectures are meant to really, and sometimes you're the one doing this, sometimes a lecturer is the one doing this, but really bridge the world of academia like, that we experience at places like Princeton Theological Seminary and the work that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. So we want you to engage with our lecture. We want you to ask questions. Um, and we are so excited for our lineup this week. We have Dr. Matthew Milliner, the Reverend Dr. Christy Lang Hurlson, and Dr. Brian Bantam. And tonight's lecture, Cleansing the Temple, will be delivered by Dr. Matthew J. Milliner. Now, you may have seen Dr. Milliner's bio on our website, but I want to read the bio that he provides for uh, folks on his website, which is millinerd.com. He may or may not be in my phone as Millinerd. Um, so, <laughs> Matthew J. Milliner, AKA Millinerd, has been teaching art history at Wheaton College since 2011. In a previous life, he earned a PhD and an MA, in the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University, where he specialized in Byzantine and medieval art. In the life before that, he graduated from Princeton Theological Seminary with an MDiv degree. In the life before that, he was the Director of Youth Ministries at Media Presbyterian Church in suburban Philadelphia. In the life before that, he went to Wheaton College, where he was, you can see a thread here, right? Um, where he was an art history major and married the other art history major. <laughs> in the life before that, he grew up in New Jersey, Brazil, and Indiana. And in the life before that, he did nothing because the originist doctrine of the pre-existence of the soul was condemned in 553 AD. <laughs> you can tell there's other Milla nerds in the room. Um, <laughs> But one of the things that drew me to make this ask of Dr. Milliner was something else I read on his website. He said that when he did youth ministry at Media Presbyterian Church, it changed everything. So I wove that into his uh, ask letter. Um, and I think that rings true for many of us, right? Uh, so many of us are accidental youth ministers, um, but this calling, this way of being in the world has changed everything for us. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Matthew J. Milliner. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Yes. Greetings in the name of the risen Lord Christ. Anybody here for the first time ever in Princeton? Wonderful. Okay. So when I first arrived on this campus with my wife to get the tour of the housing, this guy, Jonathan Walton, who is now a professor of religion at Harvard and the minister at Harvard's Memorial Church, gave my wife and I a tour. He was a PhD student at the time and perhaps sensing my concern about Princeton Theological Seminary. He told us that one of his seminary professors told him that if you stop believing in Jesus Christ's actual resurrection, you need to leave seminary. And that meant so much to me because I was wondering whether or not this was a good place to come. And Jonathan's words were a deep assurance. And now all of you first timers had the same experience because of the joyful preaching of the risen Christ by Reverend Lagonde that we just heard. We've come here in the same way, assured that the risen Christ walks on this campus. He actually has appeared to me bodily on this campus. And I don't mean he literally appeared in his risen body, because as we heard, blessed are those who have not seen but have believed. But he has appeared to me through his body, the church, through the All Saints Episcopal Bible study that met Tuesdays, 7 a.m., and still does, through reading a sentence in Hebrew at a Dunkin' Donuts for the first time, through Professor Clifton Black, who was about to run off to a meeting, yes, he's amazing, from this very room, 
And when I approached him with a question at this very lectern, he put his briefcase down, took a deep breath, and responded to me with grace. I said, don't you have to be somewhere? He's like, I have to be right here. Tell me your question. Through Professor George Huntiger, for reasons I still can't fathom, I don't know why he did this, held free Monday extracurricular sessions on how to read Karl Barth above and beyond his regular obligations. And through the vibrant Catholic and Orthodox Christians that I met, especially involved in the university over there. So these are some of the ways that Christ has met me here, and I hope that he meets you in a similar way this week. I even hope that he actually breathes on you. It's kind of a strange passage from John 20, 22. The risen Christ breathes on the disciples. I don't think I would want to be breathed on by anyone. <laughs> strange idea, but we need to be breathed on him if we want to do ministry. Breathed on him in the sense of emergency CPR. Breathed on him in a way that resuscitates us from our breathless efforts to do good stuff for God. <laughs> so I hope Christ somehow breathes on you this week and that each session and lecture, including this one, can be part of that. And here is what you are in for tonight. It is a four-part lecture, a brief introduction describing my experience both receiving and dispensing youth ministry, where I'll introduce you to a 15th century icon that encapsulates what youth ministry at its best can be. And then I'll show you how art history happily shatters our unhelpful categories of Christian division. I'll describe our present challenge, which I'm going to call, borrowing a term from a scholar in my field, our optocracy, the visual regime that we live in today. And I'll conclude with a threefold strategy to help us occupy the optocracy, we could say, that is, as Christians, to resist it. Part one. Before we begin, please join me in prayer. Father, we do know you walk on this campus. We do know your Holy Spirit is here. And as we heard today, we know that you can encounter us individually with what we need to hear. We pray that would happen this whole week and even in this room right now. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray. Amen. I came to the gospel as a teenager because of the message of grace. And it wasn't just a message, it was a community that embodied that message that was different than any other community in Haddonfield, New Jersey. In the blood sport of high school popularity contests, I had drawn a little bit of blood and more blood had been drawn from me. But in this youth group that I was drawn into, I heard the blood of Christ preached instead. There was, I learned, a God who died to end those kind of rivalries, and he generated a community of service in this town that was unlike anything I had ever seen. And the formula for that youth group was really simple. A welcoming circle, a guitar for worship, and the preaching of the cross. <laughs> and as nice as my handcrafted PowerPoint graphic is, <laughs> you can see why I did art history, not studio, right? Maybe a more beautiful art historical image that conveys the same idea is in this print by Lucas Cronach the Elder, one of Martin Luther's best friends. A circle of praise centered on the cross. And when I wandered into the breakfast club where God was sung to and the cross was preached, I recognized a community that offered something that my high school did not. This community offered grace, undeserved favor. And of all the subcultures that I knew about, athletic, academic, artistic, or even countercultural, they may have looked different on the outside, but they were each driven by a remarkably simmer, similar culture of accomplishment and reward, but not the Haddonfield United Methodist Youth Group. They offered this irresistible grace that drew me in. But when I became a youth director at Media Presbyterian Church in Pennsylvania, I think I may have forgotten that simple message of grace. Maybe I thought, I guess I had advanced beyond it. 
I think that message may have gotten lost in the pursuit of numerical success and elaborate trips, all of which have their place. But without grace, our youth group was dangerously close to being one more club competing for student attention. And what's more, the parts of me that hadn't fully received the message of grace were resurfacing through the pressures of ministry. You see, when I was an assistant youth director, I had arrogantly thought myself both cooler and wiser than the youth director that I served under. I think I really thought I could do a better job than he was doing. And eventually, I got the position of director, and then I had conflict with someone who served under me, which is to say I got a taste of my own medicine. I saw how difficult the job was that I thought I would do so well, and I think because I understood myself as a dispenser of grace rather than as a receiver of it, I grew breathless. Ministry became humiliating and exhausting. And so faced with these considerable challenges, I did the most noble, selfless, and courageous thing I could think of. I became an academic. And because God has mercy on exhausted youth ministers like me, I found grace in the academic calling as well, which is what I will share with you tonight. And the message of grace as it's appeared in my discipline of art history comes down to this particular image, an icon from the Banaki Museum in Athens, Greece. And this icon conveniently communicates nearly everything I've learned about art history in a remarkably compressed way. And I think it confronts the confusion of our visual age. It's a big claim, perhaps, but I hope to convince you of it, all of you, if I can. But the problem is it's not exactly a biblical scene. It tells an apocryphal story from Christ's life. And that word apocryphal means obscure or hidden, and it might put your Protestant guard up. I hope it does. But you see, not all apocrypha is bad. You know, there is what I would call bad apocrypha, like the Gnostic Gospel of Mary or Philip, which claims Jesus' resurrection was just a vision. Or the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas's suggestion that women have to become men to enter the kingdom of God. I hope you don't believe either of those things, and I'm glad they didn't make it into the New Testament. But there's good apocrypha too, stories that don't claim to be Scripture, but nevertheless, they claim to illuminate scripture like a good commentary does. Or maybe the way a Christian movie might reverently fill in the details that the Bible leaves out. That's what we're dealing with here. You might call this account the cleansing of the temple. And when I say that, you're probably thinking of the account that appears in all four Gospels of Jesus cleansing the Jewish temple. But this story suggests that Jesus got an early start in this temple cleansing business. And it happened during the flight to Egypt that is only recorded in Matthew's Gospel. The story goes that as Jesus, Mary, and Joseph enter pagan Egypt, the idols of the pagan temples panic and they fall. And this story takes off because it preaches. It gets incorporated even into great Orthodox hymns. And it becomes a huge part of art history. Here are two of my other favorites. In this one, Mary is concerned that Jesus is going to fall from Joseph's shoulders just like the idols are falling behind her. And those expressions convey a lot about parenting. <laughs> Kind of a snippet from my daily life, okay? And even the greatest churches of Christendom sometimes include this account on their walls as a reminder of the limits of what art can do. Now, in this apocryphal narrative, when the Holy Family enters the town, one of the idols speaks and says... A God has come here in secret who is God indeed. And those are the idol's last words before it drops dead. And all this, the account suggests, is to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah. Quote, see the Lord rides on a swift cloud and is coming to Egypt. The idols of Egypt 
and of all cultures, tremble before him. Isaiah 19.1. And you might say, okay, I get it. Joseph, Mary, Jesus, they enter Egypt and the idols fall. But who is that other God over here? Well, here's the thing. See, the priest of the deposed idol had a son. And this is where youth ministry comes into play. The boy was possessed by demons and was suffering in the hospital. And then Mary and Jesus, they show up. Mary washes Jesus' clothes, lays them out to dry, and the sick, demon-possessed, idle, glutted boy goes to dry his face with Jesus' clothes. And the demons leave him immediately. You see, Jesus was getting practice as a toddler for the exorcisms he would do in his 30s. And then the father saw what happened to his boy. Well, he converts as well. Quote from the account, my son, it is possible that this boy, Jesus, is the son of the living God who created the heavens and the earth. For he broke my idol. I think that's who the boy is in this icon, the boy whose life had been changed by Jesus and whose parents' lives were therefore changed as well. In short, refugee Jesus, job-seeking Joseph and toddler-toting Mary enter Roman Egypt and the gods fall. Unless this account seemed too fictional, we actually have just such an Egyptian temple not far from us in New York City. Dating to 10 BC, it is the temple of Dendur. Now, I doubt Jesus, Mary, and Joseph got all the way to Nubia, where this is from, in southern Egypt on their visit. But if they did, they might have seen this. And on the temple, we see Egyptian deities happily accommodating their new ruler, Augustus Caesar, who appears as the new pharaoh. Now contrast that with the story of the cleansing of the temple. Caesar makes nice with the pagan deities, Isis and Horus, but Jesus brooks no rivals. Now just a few blocks from the Met, you can walk to the Frick Collection, and you will see this image by El Greco of the fully grown Jesus doing the same thing in Jerusalem. And it is a very alluring gospel story. Who wouldn't want to be a prophetic cleanser of the temple, purifying the church of everything that is wrong with it? <laughs> but Jesus, unlike me, and unlike so many of us, manages to cleanse with love. Just look at the eyes. Here's another one at the National Gallery in D.C. Look at that face. It's filled with true prophetic grief. And because driving people from a temple is so hard to accomplish for us with love, I'm recommending this other image for us. <laughs> we can't handle Jesus' job there. Imagine, therefore, a baby defying the gods, a toddler toppling a tyrant. Mary inadvertently brings down the visual age of ancient Egypt and Rome through the simple act of doing her baby's laundry. The demons cannot bear this simple act of service. And maybe the temple of our culture can be purified in the same way, through fidelity to Christ as expressed in small acts of service. What if the dramatic change to the student around you isn't from some mega youth blockbuster event, but from your showing what it means to be faithful in the small things? That is what it was for me. My youth director, Chris Perkins, taught me guitar chords. He took me along when he went to buy a used car. And that, combined with the preaching of the cross in that simple youth group, is what brought the idols of my family down. And my parents saw something was different in me, and they were drawn to Christ as well. Now, I hope you find this apocryphal event meaningful as a commentary on the scriptural accounts of the flight to Egypt. But this image has a lot more for us. We're just getting started with it, in fact. And as I said, I think it contains a wealth of knowledge about art history, which takes us to my discipline. Some people call it art history. I think you could just as easily call it visual theology. And the first thing to say is that 
Verbal theology is wonderful. I've heard a lot of it in this very room. It has great and considerable gifts. And verbal theology, kindly lending its services to visual theology, often tells us, well, you see, there are three ways that images have functioned in the history of Christian theology. There is the Catholic and Orthodox way, where you pray not to the image, but through the image, to the prototype, to Jesus in heaven. Then there's what could be called the Reformed or the Calvinist way, which sees the... (laughs) Got to get the X in there. I had to throw in the X, right? Which sees the destruction of images as necessary. And finally, there's what could be called the Lutheran or didactic way, where images are not prayed through, but they are deemed useful for teaching to clearly communicate the gospel of grace. And that's why Luther robustly refuted Andreas Karlstadt, who said images should be destroyed, and partnered with Lucas Cronach to visually convey the message of grace in the 16th century. Now, there is truth to these categorizations, I will admit, but it's also a way that verbal theology has quarantined the complexity of visual theology as shown through the history of art. And the exciting thing is, is that the closer you look at art history and not theories about images, these neat and tidy categories, they do not survive, not for a minute. And I don't think these categories are entirely helpful in your ministry either for reasons that I'm going to try to explain. Let me give you some exciting examples as to how good art history demolishes these categories. Okay, so Mia Mochisuki in the Netherlandis image after iconoclasm, right? We thought there weren't any. <laughs> and Angela Van Halen in, in the wake of iconoclasm have shown that the reformed Calvinist churches were frequently saturated with images. This might look initially like a whitewashed Calvinist church. But look closer. Inside, there is an image of Jesus that Calvin would not have approved of there. And there is also a covert Virgin Mary below in the disguise of a regular Dutch woman nursing her child. (laughs) In decorating the godly household, religious art in post-Reformation Britain, Tara Hamling has completely upended our view of what the visual culture of English Puritans was like. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of a tree of Jesse, right, those stunning vines that illustrate the lineage of the Messiah that culminates in the rows of Mary and Jesus, I think of places like Chartres Cathedral, which you are looking at here. But to my astonishment, and perhaps to yours as well, Tamling has shown that such images showed up in the parlors of Puritans as well. It turns out that Calvinist fishmongers, after a hard day at work, like to come home to contemplate Mary, Christ, and their descendants on their ceilings. Now, one might say, well, these aren't quite devotional images, right? But David Morgan has long been showing that the history of Protestant visual piety in 19th and 20th century America shows that evangelicals have long enshrined inexpensive copies of commercial religious art and treated them reverentially in domestic piety and public worship. Over and over again, this happened. And if I could add anything to David Morgan's research, I'd suggest that evangelicalism today, for better or for worse, is also saturated with images. And when they are racially problematic, as we learned in Blum and Harvey's The Color of Christ, what do we do? We replace them with better images. I'm sure you know the story of the image of Warner Salmon's blonde-haired blue-eyed Jesus that once hung in the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. And the church was bombed in an act of terrorism that killed four girls. And the image that replaced Solomon's blonde-haired Jesus was a black Jesus that graces the cover of one of the best books of Protestant theology in the last 30 years. And believe it or not, American Protestants, we even have iconostases, 
those massive screens of images that characterize Orthodox churches. This one is at the Billy Graham Center in Charlotte, an evangelism iconostasis, we could call it, which thankfully reflects the primarily non-white reality of the evangelical global movement. Now, speaking of iconostases, the Orthodox like to think of themselves as strict users of flat iconography. But the history of Byzantine art keeps upending this assumption. Here is an undeniably three-dimensional sculpture of the Virgin Mary made in Constantinople in the late 10th or 11th century. As Bisra Pencheva puts out, points out in her book, The Sensual Icon, many Byzantine icons weren't really icons in the traditional sense at all. They were hardly the flat forms that Orthodox are supposed to use. And finally, some Catholics tell themselves the story that they always honored images while we Protestants destroyed them, but this isn't always true. Mochizuki reminds us that whitewashing was a Catholic practice long before it was a Protestant one. And Alexander Nagel has shown that church officials at the Siena Cathedral removed Duccio's famous Maya Sta altarpiece well before the Reformation in 1506 because people were treating it idolatrously. And what is more, they depicted scenes from the Old Testament on the floor in order to remind worshipers to be wary of idolatry. And this is also very much a present concern. I say this with a heavy heart, but at the Church of Our Savior on Park Avenue in Manhattan, Father George Rutler lovingly sponsored iconographical enhancement of this beautiful Romanesque church. But these icons have been removed in the last three years by Catholics. My point is just that for better or for worse, for worse Catholics too have had a long iconoclastic streak. Now, how you might wonder, is this of concern to youth ministry? I think it's incredibly relevant because if the history of art shows that Christians were promiscuous in their strategies of dealing with the visual challenges they're faced with, then that offers you freedom to use the strategies that are most helpful for you. There are some images that are worthy of destruction. And if we can't literally destroy or limit them, we should at least critique them with our words. But as the great historian Bernard McGinn reminds us, one of the great Christian visual strategies is to drive out images with images. And in this visual age, you will need to use images in your teaching ministry. The oral approach to the reformers is important, but it is not enough. You cannot afford to address the, to address the ear and to neglect the eyes. And finally, you may actually need to use images devotionally as well. So this is more what your ministries, I think, might look like. The threefold strategy I recommend to you is to avail yourself of the Catholic slash Orthodox, the Reformed, and the Lutheran approaches to images because the history of art shows that those neat categories aren't helpful anyway. And most importantly, the visual challenges we face are far stronger than anything faced in the previous centuries of the church. I hope that you are suspicious of what I just said to you. I just said that the visual challenges we face are stronger than anything faced in the previous centuries of the church. I hope that you're like, wait a second. Because anytime someone says the church has never experienced this kind of challenge, they probably just don't know church history well enough. But when it comes specifically to the extent of the images that our visual age presents us with, I think the claim that our challenge is unprecedented is defensible. This is Times Square in 1950. This is Times Square today. And if Blade Runner is right and Christ's return is delayed, there it is in 2049. <laughs> And for those of us who think that this proliferation of images poses only opportunities to Christians, I like to share the story of the Church of the Holy Communion. The church still stands in midtown Manhattan. It was once a forerunner of 
high church evangelicalism fused with service to the poor. Eucharist was weekly. Women were prominent in their ministries, and the first convention of black Episcopal clergymen met here in 1883. And by 1983, the Church of the Holy Communion had become the Limelight Nightclub, center of the recreational drug trade in New York. And then it became the Limelight Shops, offering a literal illustration of James K.A. Smith's observation that the cultural liturgy of the mall competes with the church. In this case, the mall colonizes the church. On my visit a few years ago, dressing booths seemed to evoke confessionals where you could unburden yourself of stylistic sin. <laughs> now, I've talked about this church before, but I have the next chapter for you. Surely to the disappointment of investors, the mall never fully materialized, but what came in its place might be worse. The latest incarnation of famed architect Richard Upjohn's exquisite Gothic jewel is as an exercise parlor where sins, at least of the dietary variety, can be cycled away. And now those confessional booths, well, that's where you go suit up for a workout, and there are even mocking stained glass windows where Satan presides over your obsession with your body image. And I get it. Like, I have irony. I understand, right? But for those of us who know the students in our charges and for many of us ourselves, that might be a little bit too close to the truth. Now, you might not live in New York and you say, okay, this isn't really a problem for me. But the consumerist power that successfully colonized this church lives in your and in my pocket. So here is a chart of camera production by year. And in an about you know, 1933 there, and by the time you get to 1955, you can see the production increasing. The blue are digital cameras, and the yellow are smartphones. And this means that I would imagine we produce more images in, in maybe a decade than perhaps in the entire 16th century. It's hard to know that, but maybe the planet now produces more images in a year or even a month than were made when the Protestant Reformation happened. And I can say that because I'm not showing you the entire chart. It goes all the way up to there. And that's 2011. And this makes ours the era of the natural disaster selfie, the Sistine selfie, the Holy Sepulcher selfie. And here is that famous comparison of papal inaugurations between 2005 and 2013. Now, it's not just images which can be innocent enough. And I'm well aware that I'm using images in this presentation. What makes them dangerous, though, <laughs> is when they are harnessed to a program of self-justification as we attempt to become the fitter, happier, more productive, more productive people that Radiohead prophesied we would become in their 1999 album, OK Computer. And as Edward Tenor puts it, if the online moguls had truly sinister designs, it would be far easier to reform their enterprises or break them up. Part of the problem is that they don't know how to control the new world they have created. Nobody's in control of this. So that means that Silicon Valley defectors like Tristan Harris have declared that after years of trying to reform this culture from within, Working at Google, he said, you just can't do it. He said, I was there when they brought in the famous Zen monk, and it did nothing. Harris is doing what he can now from without, and I hope he succeeds. But meanwhile, the insecurities of you, me, and our students are being monetized by Snapchat, <laughs> by engineers whose sole job is to keep kids on their phones. And so I do think it may be fair to say that, visually speaking, there is nothing 
in the history of the Christian church that has been faced like this. And here comes the lecture's big reveal. I'll admit I'm kind of excited about it. I've already mentioned that we no longer have the luxury of choosing between the three Christian approaches that I have mentioned, Catholic, Orthodox, veneration, Lutheran uses of images for teaching and reform breaking of images. But pure quarantine Christian traditions are incapable of withstanding what we're being faced with, though conveniently enough, each of the strategies I've described is contained in the image of our baby Jesus cleansing the temple. And for our last part, I'd like to outline that briefly. So you've got the Lutheran point, Joseph pointing to the truth and then actually engaging the truth of Jesus here personally and then the destruction of images. You need all three, is my claim. To begin with, who among us in 2018 can afford not to be an iconoclast? Now, usually when I teach early Christian art history, I have to explain, even apologize, for why they saw the need to deconstruct the images of the ancient pagan world. Often early Christian attitudes to images are seen as oppressive, as Philistine, or unduly appreciative of the joys of aesthetics. Well, I don't have to make those apologies anymore. Never has it been easier to gain sympathy for this early Christian posture to images because we've seen the need for it as a society. To tear images down is now seen is as a necessity. And so perhaps we could juxtapose this map of the iconoclastic movement in European history that many Protestants have been embarrassed about with this map of our own iconoclastic movement that swept through this country in the last year. And we can be reminded that image breaking sometimes is necessary. Or maybe this juxtaposition to that image of Christ cleansing the temple will work for us as well. But a chief worry I have about our cultural moment is what is going to replace the images that have been torn down. And if you know where to look, there are already monuments in the American South that have already addressed this. For example, at UNC Chapel Hill, not far from the Silent Sam Memorial to Confederate soldiers, there is this image of African Americans, both slave and free, who built the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. And it is one of the most powerful monuments I'm aware of. It has already rebuked the Confederate monuments nearby. What I mean here is that the answer to destructive images are constructive ones. And for this category, I'm appealing to the Lutheran perspective, which offered that middle way between Calvinist and Catholic approaches. This is going to take a little bit of explaining as to why I've made this connection. A few years ago, I enjoyed having a little bit of fun with Katy Perry. Um, so... It, taking this verse from Revelation, you're just, hey, there it was, right? So, and I, I was careful to say that I wasn't actually suggesting that she was the woman foretold in the book of Revelation, even if there were some curious parallels to our annual football spectacle. But it was interesting this year when in the midst of Timberlake's performance, a massive purple icon of Prince proclaimed the message from his most explicitly biblical song, I Would Die For You. Now, one can read that song as some gender-bending ego trip, much as people have read the German artist Albrecht Dürer's self-portrait of himself as Jesus, as hopelessly arrogant. But another, and I think better way to read the Dürer portrait is as the, as the artist proclaiming his hope to be like the icon of Jesus. And in the same way, another way to read the Prince song is as a simple proclamation of what Christ did for us, which make this too, a rather biblical Super Bowl, but in the positive sense, confirmed by the Eagles' victory. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that we need to be on the lookout for moments we can harness in our culture. I think I did too much of that when I was a youth director, but those moments are still there, as well as moments that we have to oppose. 
Durr was famously lifted from a serious bout of depression through the message of grace he encountered by reading Martin Luther. And it might seem strange to categorize this teaching of imagery again under the banner of Luther, but in doing so, I'm focusing on images that teach grace. From the great Minneapolis Luther exhibition catalog, here is a chart of the system of indulgences that had taken over what remained of the Holy Roman Empire in Luther's day. Now, Cardinal Albert of Brandenburg is up here, and he had to borrow money from the Fugger banking family. They're over here, the Fuggers. And he did that in order to purchase the position of archbishop. Oh, we don't have grace yet. Okay, all right. It's coming. It's coming. There's, their grace is coming. Okay. To purchase it from the Pope, who was selling it to him. And then in order to pay back that massive loan to the Fuggers, he had to collect indulgences from the populace essentially selling salvation. And when Luther opposed this system because of his rediscovery, not discovery, but rediscovery of the theology of grace, it threatened this system. A system which countless Catholics then and now freely confess was in dire need of reform. Grace rendered these indulgences unnecessary. Grace disrupted the order and tragically, due to fault on both sides, the unity of Christ's body, which had yet to heal from the east-west split of 1054, was shattered once again. Luther's visual solution, however, was ingenious. He wanted a church that was, yes, purged of images, but in its center would be a didactic image of law and gospel, his interpretive key that unlocked the entire Bible. And so a cleansing was necessary, but a clear visual exposition of the Bible as well. And on the left side of these images, we see what God commands and which we cannot give. And on the right side, God graciously gives what he commands. If you feel the Augustinian rhythms to that, you're exactly right. And as Luther put it in the Heidelberg Disputation written 500 years ago this month, the law says, do this and it's never done. And grace says, believe this and it's Already done. <laughs> this is what I heard in that youth group. This is what captured my heart. The message of grace liberates. And thanks be to God, you are as likely to find this message of grace among Catholics like Henry Nouwen or Jacques Philippe as you will among Protestants. Now, some have suggested, however, that this image of grace is not as relevant for people today who tend not to worry as much about the fate of their eternal souls. If people of the 16th century were driven by questions of salvation, some have said we as a population seem to be driven by something else. As Alan Ehrenberg puts it, quote, and this is a great quote, the question that hovers over your character today is no longer that of how good you are, but how capable you are. And with this shift comes a new pathology. The affliction of guilt has given way to weariness. Weariness with the vague and unending project of having to become one's fullest self. And we call this depression. And this wearying project of self-creation is what our digital moguls are harnessing. And the good news is, that grace cuts through the project in exactly the same way as it did in the 16th century. Our indulgences may look different. Perhaps you recognize Lacey's personal rating from a chilling episode about our rating one another in Black Mirror. But the solution to those indulgences is the same. God's justifying, shame-shattering favor where our record becomes his and his record becomes ours. And I think this means that the solution to our dilemma is no different than it was for me in the 1990s, right? Preach the cross, preach grace, and never graduate from that basic message. As one Lutheran theologian puts it so well, quote, our progress in the Christian life is progress into the cross and resurrection of Christ. We enter more deeply into the beginning of our Christian life rather than becoming ever more distant from it, end quote. And images can convey that message of grace as much as can words. And this positive use of images might 
it seems to me, even permit, maybe even require their devotional use to counteract the power of the optocracy around us. And that leads to the last of our threefold strategies. I began this talk by telling you some of my mistakes in youth ministry, and I'll conclude by telling you one small success. My friend Ed Hilton and I, who was the children's minister at Media Presbyterian Church, we looked at the media that our students were already saturated with in the early 2000s, and we took them all away on a Lenten retreat that we entitled Just God. And it worked. We went to the woods. We did silent hikes. There were no devices. And as I've continued this tradition in my work at Wheaton College, I've seen that in this kind of contemplative practice, devotional use of an image is very helpful as well. In the art department, we gather during Advent and Lent for morning and evening prayer in non-required, that's the most important thing, students don't have to come, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays before this replica of an ancient image of the Jewish, Jewish Jesus from Mount Sinai. And in these service, I think I have witnessed a small miracle. We've prayed through dozens of school shootings in these services. We've prayed for people who are sick and for people who have died. And in the five years of doing these services, I have never been alone. <laughs> I've sometimes wanted to be. <laughs> there has always been somebody else. And this Ash Wednesday, I was so tired, I'm like, I'm not going to do them anymore. And on Ash Wednesday, I get a handwritten note from a Fulbright scholar in Germany who sent this to me, and I opened it up, and it said, Dear Dr. Milliner, I'd like to thank you as you begin those Lenten services again because they were so formative to me. And I just took that note in hand, and I said, I've got to keep going. And lo and behold, one of my friends was afflicted with something serious, and he was there to pray with me because of those services. <laughs> That's the simple miracle. I'm never alone when I do it. Students actually show up. And I think they show up because it's not about me. It's about them encountering Christ, which is accentuated through the use of this icon. They're not looking here. They're looking there. But even so, I don't think that one image, one icon even, even if, if it's an icon as good as this one, is adequate. Because what about the moving image? What about the countless reels of Netflix shows that we all have access to? What is the Christian response to that? I actually think I have one. I think the solution is more devotional films about Jesus. Hundreds and hundreds of devotional films about Jesus. And you and your students, I'm happy to tell you, are capable of creating them. I don't know what scenario you're imagining right now, like a quick kind of attempt to do it. But what I mean is something different than sending your students to film school. The kind of films I'm talking about are far better and far more personally significant than anything even the most brilliant indie Christian director could come up with. What I'm suggesting is that you might simply consider introducing both yourselves and your students to the spiritual exercises. When Ignatius of Loyola, a Spanish soldier, laid down his sword and went to a cave in Manresa, he used the imaginative capacity that God gave him to put himself into the gospel stories personalized account of the New Testament with you in every scene. And in so doing, he was following in the great tradition of Christian painting that did precisely that for lay people. That guy was not at the Annunciation. He's a 15th century Dutchman, but he's in it now. And when Ignatius did this, he did it without brushes. He opened up an incredibly powerful, what we might say proto-cinematic, tool for training young people in how to harness the mind's ability to make images in the service of Christ. Ignatius didn't discover this technique any more than Luther discovered grace, but like Luther, Ignatius deployed effectively what he found. And the reason I can speak about this technique is because I had the incredible luxury of being guided through the exercises over a year by the gifted spiritual directors at the Church of the Resurrection in Wheaton. And the good news is they put all of their stuff online. 
imaginatively immersing yourself in the gospel scenes and letting Jesus speak to your students individually is one of the most powerful tools in the Christian spiritual tradition that I am aware of. It really is better than Hulu, Netflix, Amazon Prime, YouTube, or however your students access their content combined. And ultimately, that tradition, which has been used by Protestants for over 100 years, might be the only thing powerful enough to resist what might be coming down the pike. So let me summarize this four-part talk that you have generously listened to with four sentences to conclude. The challenge of this new optocracy we are faced with is unprecedented. And as a result, the temple of our minds and hearts need cleansing like never before. Your Christian tradition alone, whatever it is, is outmatched by this visual age. But the entire Christian tradition, Reformed, Lutheran, Orthodox, and Catholic, and others that I have not had time to mention today, together might actually stand a chance. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much.